<clears throat> hey folks, good evening. Welcome to Seattle's Civil War Legacy on a sleepy Monday evening um, in December. Um, happy to welcome back Avery Lentz once again. Uh, I think this is probably what your third time, third time. coming on to talk to us um, here on the staying up late to entertain us West Coasters. Um, Anything. So tonight. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're way nicer than the East Coast, that's for sure. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a bit about the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, it, the battle itself, um, the main fighting of the battle occurred today, 159 years ago, December 13th. But of course, the like like any battle, anything can't be viewed in isolation. Even the day of fighting is part of the campaign in general. Um, so tonight with Avery, I think we're going to go back almost probably in the wake of the Battle of Antietam, because that's really where Fredericksburg kind of starts. And uh, when we talked about uh, the Overland campaign, of course, we started with Gettysburg, because you have to, you know, have a reason that these things happen the way that they do. Um, so that will be the uh, topic of discussion tonight is kind of not a tactical discussion. There's plenty of avenues for you to find that information uh, between all the different battlefield websites and national parks websites and other historians. Uh, so we're not going to get too into the nitty gritty of what division did what and what brigade did this and that. Uh, we're going to look a little bit bigger picture at the whole thing. Um, so Avery, just uh, real quick for anybody who hasn't seen you uh, here before, just tell us a little bit about uh, your kind of background and interest in why uh, Fredericksburg and, of course, Spotsylvania County in general is something you know so well. Sure. So I studied American history and civil war era studies at Gettysburg College for undergrad, and then I went on to get my master's at Shippensburg University in applied history, which is more museum studies, battlefield preservation, um, and any type of public interpretation of history and landmarks kind of outside a classroom or an academic setting. So I always had a, a desire to work with the National Park Service. Uh, when I was younger, I got an internship at Gettysburg for the 150th of the battle, and there was a huge moment to be a part of. And yeah. after that, I ended up working four summers uh, for Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. And, uh, you know, while I was there, Fredericksburg was a big part of the job, obviously. It's in the name. And obviously, sure. uh, if you've never been to Fredericksburg, definitely recommend it. It's one of the coolest towns, cities, whatever you want to call it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and on the eastern seaboard, in my opinion, and it definitely was a big deal back in the day. It's a bigger deal now. I mean, Fredericksburg has the biggest mall on the east coast, I guess, or shopping <laughs> hub. <laughs> is what that. That's what they're known for today. But obviously, you know, the town's great, community's great, the historical atmosphere is very pervading. You have Mary Washington, uh, her house is there, George yeah. Washington's childhood home um, is there. And so it's, you know, there's a lot of Virginia history, but there's also a lot of rich American history that intersects in and out of Fredericksburg. Uh, over time. And, you know, everyone, of course, came, uh, the big allure to Fredericksburg is the stone wall that, you know, as seen in the movie Gods and Generals, that obviously sparked a lot of people's interest uh, in coming to the park to see that side of the story. But mm -hmm. as we'll talk about tonight, that was obviously a very small part of it. And I was learning that on the job while I was there is this is a very intricate campaign. And one of the most important lessons that they teach you as a park ranger, especially if you deal with Civil War and Terp, uh you're dealing with the ideas that people are bringing to you from outside sources and hmm. the big famous popular one is burnside has to be a freaking idiot for him to do mm -hmm. this photo you know i mean i heard all kinds yeah. of names and slurs <laughs> hurled at the guy uh and you know you hear the same thing with the whole grants of butcher myth that people would bring for the wilderness and spotsylvania battle battlefields down there so i mean part of my job was taking those ideas and trying to turn them on their heads trying to get people to look at it in a new light and a different um aspect of it because as we'll talk about uh sometimes to put it very 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 simply shit happens and on a battlefield especially that is very prevalent the unexpected is always around the corner you have to adapt as a commander in the field um but you also have to consider what is eating them eating at them at the back of their minds especially mm -hmm. the commander of the army taking orders from the president of the united states directly and um on a campaign that is very much 
politically important and politically strategic as it is militarily strategic. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why Fredericksburg is such a fascinating campaign. And I think it's because it's a great example. Uh, and we kind of touched on this in the Overland campaign in a way, but Fredericksburg itself is a great example of how politics and, and mm -hmm. a lot of outside factors factor in yeah. what happens on one day, in this case, December 13th. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, I've learned over the years to appreciate that convergence of factors yeah. in this battle. And of course, it happens when there's, you know, in the context of everything else that's happened in the, in the war at that time, as well as 1862 rolls into 1863. But there's it's so rare that we have such a big military event at this time of year um, that it almost makes us think about it in an isolated kind of way. Um, I think anyway, especially in the reading about it, there's so much on the military history, but but a holistic look at the battle is kind of hard to find. And I think that's more important than anything as understanding. And of course the losses were catastrophic mm -hmm. in the fight and, and strategies were adjusted and, and military structure in the army of the Potomac was, was changed, but nationally what's going on and politically and, and all of that is, is so affected by what happens here. Uh, that affects everything going forward. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, let's, like I had said off the top, I think we've got uh, more viewers now than we had when I first was getting into this, but let's start in the wake of the Battle of Antietam. So right. generally has been for, I, I think you and I agree on this, defeated at Sharpsburg, and he's sent back south across the Potomac River. Uh, and we have... The, again, there might be some mythology behind this too, but McClellan is sort of stuck and he's sitting on his heels and he's not doing anything in Maryland. Lee goes back south into Virginia. And then the next thing on the calendar is Fredericksburg three months later. So what happens in between? Uh, and we can start with uh, this scene here, which I think we've all seen many, many times is Lincoln coming down to deal with McClellan in the wake of, of Sharpsburg. And this is where the Fredericksburg campaign really begins, is probably right here in this tent. Yeah, so I've heard that that photo, I believe it's supposed to be October 12th when Lincoln visits McClellan at Sharpsburg. And, you know, that obviously is a incredibly bloody battle, the single bloodiest day of American military history, 23,000 casualties for both sides. Um, and in terms of the percentages of the armies, uh, Confederates take a higher percentage of casualties, even though they take less than the Union forces. But nevertheless, both armies need to just take a minute <laughs> and take a breather, yeah. try to uh, catch their breath. And I think that at this stage in 1862, that's very normal. Obviously, you're not going to see the continuous fighting like well, like that we will see in 1864 that we discussed mm -hmm. in our previous episodes. But for the Union Army, the Potomac, they are going to be consolidating a lot of their units because a lot of their units were spread out. A lot of different divisions and corps and whatnot are not mm -hmm. all at Sharpsburg when that battle uh, takes off at Antietam. So the Union Army is going to be taking that time. I do have to give it to McClellan that he is going to be taking some time to reorganize. And not to mention on October 10th, 1862, uh, Jeb Stewart will ride up to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. He'll raid there. He'll steal a bunch of Union supplies. He'll capture some Union prisoners who were mostly wounded soldiers being brought up there from Antietam. And um, he's going to burn the railroad depot there. So he's going to gather a whole portion of different supplies, like kind of similar to his ride around uh, the Union Army during the Gettysburg campaign. And so after this, I mean, if you're McClellan, it's understandable that you might be a little more cautious than you previously have been, especially mm -hmm. with being not too far from Washington, but far enough that Confederate cavalry riding around you is a considerable threat. So it could explain his sluggishness here. Um, and he did have an initial plan. And, you know, he is going to have the very small but very uneventful Loudoun campaign, a lot of cavalry skirmishing and a lot of uh, a lot of infantry skirmishing as well, but not a full fledged fight. Um, the Confederate army is going to split up. And half of them under Jackson, obviously, Jackson's Corps, the second corps of the Confederate Army, they are going to head to the valley again where they uh, had reigned supreme there in the spring of 1862. So they're going to return to the valley uh, in early fall, and they're going to stay there uh, anchored around Winchester and um, areas between Winchester and uh, Lynchburg and basically stay in that area there. Yeah, you see their lines and whatnot. Yeah. 
um, around Front Royal it, as well. And this map covers what about a month of activity. So yeah. uh, the positions that, that Avery is referring to right now are reflected on the map and the entire month of what he's going to talk about leading up to Fredericksburg. It's all contained on this single map here. So just so everybody mm -hmm. knows what we're looking at. And Lee decides he's going to go with Longstreet. Um, he's going to leave that autonomy to Jackson in the Valley, but he's going to head with Longstreet back. Eventually they're going to head south to Culpeper Courthouse, uh, which is a nice midway point. You can see that uh, you can see Fredericksburg, obviously to the east there, but you got to also remember Richmond is just a few miles south. Um, and then you can see Washington on the map. So Culpeper is kind of a, interesting position where you have the Blue Ridge Mountains to your rear. You can now face east. You can keep an eye on Washington. And if a Union Army does attempt to move, you have Jackson in the Valley. You have Longstreet at Culpeper. They do have to cross this area. Um, and also, if you can look at the railroad lines, if need be, if McClellan does try another peninsula campaign, you can put the Army on the railroad, set them back down to Richmond. So Lee's position here is actually very strategic. But at this point, when a lot of the Union forces you see on the map are moving, uh, there's going to be some changes on the Union side of things. So back to uh, to the um, northern side of things after Lincoln's visit to McClellan. That visit was kind of meant to for Lincoln to assess the situation, assess the mm -hmm. condition of the army, assess the condition of the arm of the officers and whatnot, and basically gauge what McClellan's going to do. And McClellan is very adamant that uh, you know he's he's got a plan and it's going to take time and. Um, but there's a lot of accounts that say McClellan's very annoyed by this visit. He's very frazzled by Lincoln's continual pressure on him. And I mean, you know, no one likes their boss breathing down their neck, but McClellan is going to be moving so sluggishly here that, um, you know, he, there's a lot of action going forward here, uh, or at least a desire for action on Lincoln's side of things, because the biggest thing, the biggest political move that we have here in the fall is after the Battle of Antietam, the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation is announced, it's issued. <clears throat> um, and that, of course, is a wartime measure to liberate and um, emancipate all enslaved individuals in the states in active rebellion against the federal government. So what that means is everyone in the Confederacy, their states are free. Imagine, I, I mean, rhetorical question, Richard, but how many of those states do you think where the union control is not prevalent, do you think they, that had much effect? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, not yeah, much. A lot of people have said yeah. that this, instead of the Emancipation Proclamation, it's a, a proclamation of emancipation. It's backwards. And it really mm. much was that, but it is a wartime measure. And so for the areas that the Union Army has occupied, has gone through, any of those enslaved individuals who had been confiscated beforehand, they're now free. They're no longer confiscated uh, part material of war as they were looked at that they're now in emancipated people, but it is only a wartime measure. So this isn't like the 13th Amendment. When the war is over, whoever wins or loses, those emancipated people will have to go back to enslavement, or at least that was the idea. So the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation, regardless of its teeth, regardless of how much of an effect it did have uh, physically on the war itself, it is absolutely a defining moment in the war so far. Now this war is going to be about something much, much different. Lincoln had already started, uh, you know, looking and trying to change this war actually back in the summer when he starts coming up with these confiscation acts to try to uh, move forces away from, or move, move the Union Army's goals away from just reunion and make uh -huh. one more freedom. And it gives the North more of a a, uh, a very strong cause to get behind morally anyway. And now at least for the Union Army, obviously you're going to have people out there saying, well, everyone was racist back then. Well, yeah, no shit. Uh, the point is, is that on paper, the Federal Army, the U.S. Army, can now say that their cause is one that is for freedom, that they are out to emancipate 4 million enslaved people. Yeah. And so regardless of what they think of people in their own minds ideologically, as a causation of the war, as a cause to get behind, the North now has the moral high ground. Yeah. And it is said that with that proclamation, this is why, you know, un ultimately France and Great Britain decide not to give uh, foreign recognition to the Confederacy. And so yeah. there is that huge social and political and foreign diplomatic side of this proclamation. And that's what has teeth. Now, this proclamation is going to take effect as a military um issue or a military issued order on January 1st, 1863. So the first day of the new year, this is going into effect. The problem is, like I had said, you know, obviously a lot of people are very prejudiced in the North. 
And yeah. um, midterms are just around the corner. So we have midterm elections in 1862 and the mm -hmm. Democrats sweep everything. Um, yeah. So it looks like, you know, they're making a resurgence. It looks like people are at least starting to voice a little more anti-war sentiment. You got to imagine after mm -hmm. Antietam, there is that kind of fatigued feeling of, wow, this is such a bloody conflict. Should it really go on any any longer? And now you're telling us it's a war about freeing African Americans or black folk and blah, 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 blah. you know, you have yeah. various people across the board yeah. um, not being in support of this proclamation. But nevertheless, um, like I said, this is their cause now. And I mean, it's not like everyone in the North's against the proclamation. Obviously, not everyone's for it, but not everyone's against it. Uh, people yeah. are pretty much down the middle. And uh, there is a lot of, of, of consternation within the armies as well. Uh, the Army of the Potomac reacts sure. to the proclamation very uh, diversely, I should say. Some men, you know, find it very uh, inspiring to have this new cause, this new co mm -hmm. cause to get behind. Others are a little more. Yeah. You know, well, how about how about McClellan himself being a Democrat and and uh, ha having his own views of, that conflicted with with what Lincoln was doing? Does that factor into this? for him and though their relationship at this point as as we're coming upon that change so i mean cody and i actually touched on mcclellan this whole topic of mcclellan and his ideologies uh during our petersburg part three episode we were discussing the uh election of 1864 and a lot of people the common you know narrative before this is mcclellan is going to you know he's going to be running on a platform of armistice that he's going to sue for peace and that mm -hmm. obviously he's not going to reinforce anything like the emancipation proclamation he's not even going to really and a lot of people were worried that he wasn't going to ratify the 13th either um so i mean there's a lot of what ifs that play out of the election of 1864 but if you look back at 1862 um there's a reason for that because mcclellan you know, as you said is a democrat at the time and he um is very I guess, open about his political leanings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, nevertheless, I mean, he never comes out and says this proclamation is an affront to me personally, and I would never fight sure. for it. But at the same time, he had been adamant that this war was going to be a limited war. It was not going to be a total war. It was not going to touch on the subject of slavery. It was not going to touch on the subject of emancipation. That's not what this war was about in his mind. It was more about the reunification of the country. And for McClellan, that is the only goal that he really cares about. Um, so a lot of people have said, you know, after the proclamation issued, that's why McClellan's going to drag his feet. Um, mm -hmm. we're, there's not a lot of accounts that really support that, but I mean, it's not too mm -hmm. far fetched of a thought uh, given, yeah. you know, just how things pan out. And yeah. regardless, you know, as much as I can play devil's advocate, McClellan, he does not make a good case for that at all to, on what we see pan out. Uh, you know, he does have a plan, and this movement that we see on the map is part of that plan. He wants to now move back towards uh, central Virginia, move south of Washington. It's going to be more of a uh, overland campaign in the sense of the word, uh, as we are now not taking the peninsula kit route anymore. Even though there's still Union forces down there, the bulk of the Union Army of the Potomac will be moving in this area, or at least operating in this area. And Fredericksburg had been on everyone's minds. I mean, this is not the first time that both sides start to view or shift their views towards Fredericksburg itself. Yeah. It should be noted, the, uh, excuse me, the Union forces were there in the spring of 1862. You had Urban <laughs> McDowell with the Union First Corps, which will be, at the time, the First Corps of the Army of Virginia. And those units <laughs> had become part of the Army of the Potomac. But McDowell's forces had been there in the spring of 1862. And there had been three major bridges that crossed um, the area around Fredericksburg where the Rappahannock River flows around there. And those bridges are the Falmouth Bridge, the William Street Bridge has also been called the Chatham Bridge, and there was a covered railroad bridge there as well. All three of these bridges will be destroyed that spring by Confederate militia in Fredericksburg, which numbered between 900 to 1,000 men. But, you know, McDowell arrives there with 30,000 Union soldiers in the spring of 62, and there is this mass exodus. There is not there's not even an estimated number, but it's, or there is an, there's an approximated number, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, that between May and, or excuse me, between April and July of 1862, in those four months time, uh, you're going to see roughly 10,000 African-Americans cross the Rappahannock into Union lines to freedom. There's this mass exodus. And so that's when Lincoln comes down there. He comes to visit Fredericksburg to see George Washington's boyhood home. Um, 
George Washington, you know, was also very uh, familiar with Chatham Manor, which is the home of the Fitzhughes. Big prominent Virginia families are in the area. Uh, contrary to previous belief, this is not the same house that Robert E. Lee ported Mary Custis, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. mint of Chatham. But nevertheless, uh, the Union Army is familiar with this area. Lincoln is familiar with this area. And it is the halfway point between the capitals. You have yeah. Washington in the north, Richmond is directly to the south. You have the Rich you have the Fredericksburg, Richmond, and Potomac Railroad that runs directly down to the Confederate capital. You have the Rappahannock River, which is one of the longest rivers in Virginia, and it's one of the most considerable obstacles to cross when you're heading south. But also it's very close to, as you can see on the map there, you might be able to make out a quiet landing next to Hooker's name. On the Potomac River, uh, if you can capture a quiet landing, you can float men, material, whatever you need down there. And Fredericksburg is right there for the taking. So strategically, Fredericksburg is a very important city on the map or a very important town. And so McClellan had had his eye on Fredericksburg, but getting everyone organized, getting things together, and you know he's going to be replenishing his, his numbers. His numbers were only about 60,000 at Antietam, but as his army consolidates, in the area around Warrington, Virginia, as you can see on the map there, the Union Army of the Potomac will swell to about 123,000 men. So this is a very large army, larger than what he had down on the peninsula. And a lot of these new swellings of the ranks is, uh, is credited to the nine-month volunteers uh, that <laughs> were gathered during Lee's first invasion uh, of the northern areas around Maryland, obviously. But um, now the army is very large. And so McClellan had had this idea that he was going to ship to Fredericksburg, but it takes a lot of time. And he doesn't really defend himself very well when the critics start seeping in as we move from September into October and then October mm -hmm. and November. And finally, by November 9th, where there's not a lot of movement, you know, there could have been in the coming like next couple of days. But nevertheless, that's been too long for Lincoln. And after the, the events of uh, the midterm elections, Lincoln's just kind of fed up and he's He's done. So on November 9th, 1862, McClellan will be relieved of command from the Army of the Potomac, and he will be replaced with Ambrose Everett Burnside. And <laughs> man, what a what a cool set of facial hairs. Let's that, go uh, back here. And... Yeah, you got it. You had him. Uh, oh, there, there we go. go. Yeah. So good old well, Ambrose recognizable Ambrose. man of the war, honestly, yeah. I think. Not where sideburns come from, strangely enough. He just happened to have that name. Or, yeah. you know, could he have grown the sideburns because of his last name? Who knows? <laughs> but he is an 1847 West Point graduate. He does see some little action during the Mexican-American War, but not a lot. Uh, after that, he goes to civilian life, like many of the generals did after the Mexican War. And he will try his luck at business during the 1850s. He fails. He is a failed businessman during the antebellum period. But once the war begins, uh, since he had previous experience uh, and he's a West Pointer, he does get a commission in the U.S. Army. And so he will raise a bunch of volunteers. He leads a brigade of Rhode Islanders at first bull run. They do get into considerable fighting there, and he does, for the most part, a darn good job uh, commanding them in the field. So he has that experience. He's later going to, by the next year, in the spring of 1862, take on the Coastal Carolinas campaign. He's going to conduct mm -hmm. amphibious operations at New Bern, North Carolina. And it's the first time that a lot, that really any Union general in the war, with the exception of Ulysses S. Grant at Belmont, it's the first time that he, co he coordinated between naval and ground forces, conducting an amphibious assault under fire uh, from Confederate artillery during that. So that was very impressive. And those, those Carolina campaigns were a Union success and one of the few Union successes in the Eastern theater of the war uh, by this point. As we know, mm -hmm. you know, Grant lands a lot of victories in Tennessee, biggest being mm -hmm. Shiloh, but in the East, Eastern theater, there hadn't really been a lot of luck. Obviously the Peninsula campaign, it's gonna end in a Union retreat back to Yorktown. Then you have you know the disaster after disaster in the Shenandoah Valley that gives Stonewall Jackson such fame. And then you also have in August, the blunders at Second Manassas under John mm -hmm. Hope which leads to the invasion of Maryland. And of course the bloody fighting at South Mountain and Antietam and Harper's Ferry, but mostly obviously the big one is Antietam there. So uh, during the Antietam campaign, during the Maryland campaign, Burnside will be recalled back from the coast. He will take command of the Union Ninth Corps for a time he was the wing commander, a left wing commander um, for McClellan's forces during the Maryland campaign. But during the battle, he. Uh, is going to get downgraded after Jesse Reno is killed at South Mountain. He gets back 
he gets sent back to ninth core command and he will make a series of frontal charges at a very difficult place to attack which is of course the uh antietam bridge or the very famous burnside bridge um and that's kind of one of the first places where you see people start to really criticize him because his casualties are bad he's throwing forces at a very strongly mm -hmm. confederate enemy and eventually the union forces are successful in taking uh the bridge itself but ap hills flank attack in the afternoon it reels his forces back towards the creek and ultimately saves the confederate army from annihilation so um that's like really the only big uh mention of notoriety that the rest of the army of the Potomac has with Burnside when he is mm -hmm. given the command in early November. So a lot of them are saying, who the hell is this guy? You know, and, and he hasn't really been a very flashy character because unlike Pope and McClellan, he's not very politically open. And at the very least, mm -hmm. he doesn't even seem like he has any political affiliations. He seems like a straight through and through military moderate man. And, you know, in Lincoln's eyes, that's refreshing <laughs> to mm -hmm. not have any kind of politically motivated generals. And, you know, after his success at Coastal Carolinas, it seems like he could have uh, the experience that comes with commanding a large group of men, which obviously commanded large forces at the coast, but not 123,000. You know, this is still, yeah. I love to remind people that when you think of 123,000 men in an army, that doesn't seem like a, a large number to us today, but back in 1862, back in the 19th century with no walkie talkies, no cell phones, nothing, no satellites, nada, nada, that, you know, that's an impossible amount of men to command successfully and without mm -hmm. that error. Do you You're think the logistics, have... the logistics of his Carolina experience maybe gave him a little leg up in Lincoln's opinion? Cause he's a pretty average, say. he's a pretty average guy. Yeah. Um, and in the, really the, I understand it, that such a big portion of the difficulty of being a commander was simply the logistical management of an army. Oh, like you said, 120 men with horses and nothing else to, to move that kind of thing. You need somebody that you have that that confidence in that can that can handle that kind of work. And, and so – Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. I was going to say, I was just, you know, with the lack of, of military, notable military success on that level, it just seems like maybe that was part of what made him attractive. It was yeah, just, like, he, he might be the guy. That's the point I was making. I mean, his performance on the coastline in North Carolina is going to really win him accolades because he is the only one in the Virginia theater that actually had success, or at least the Eastern theater yeah, uh, yeah, in yeah, 1862. Sure. And so, I mean... When also, you got to look at Corps commanders uh, by the end of Antietam. You know, Joseph K. Mansfield was killed, 12th Corps commander. Um, you know, William French, uh, not William French, but Edwin Sumner, uh, he's getting up there. He's old, he's grizzled. You can't really, you know, pick him as a replacement uh, or anything. Uh, you have Lambie Franklin, but he didn't really, uh, he was the former 6th Corps commander. He didn't really show a lot of drive during the Maryland campaign. Uh, and then, so really, if you look at the commanders, the top level commanders, uh, for the Union Army. It's Burnside or Hooker. Hooker commanding the 1st Corps, Burnside commanding the Ninth Corps uh, as a possible replacement for McClellan. And I think mm -hmm. what's fascinating is when uh, Lincoln is kind of, you know, weighing his options here, Hooker is a Republican-fueled uh, uh, general. So a lot of people behind Lincoln are saying, pick Hooker, go with Hooker. But Lincoln really wanted someone who would not you know, bring politics into the forefront, for, forefront of the of their decision making and whatnot. So I think it's yes, his his experience with logistics, his experience with different types of military units, and his more moderate look on politics that made Burnside an attractive military yeah. candidate. And what's fascinating is Burnside very quickly says, "I'm not the man for the job. I don't want this job." He actually regarded McClellan with a wide amount of respect it never really made sense because mccullen kind of dissed him on the maryland campaign but nevertheless burnside is is so apologetic when he meets with mccullen to turn over command and mccullen runs burnside through his plan so a lot of what burnside is inevitably going to execute was at the very base of it uh mccullen's plan to head towards richmond and so burnside decides that um you know he, he really doesn't want this really doesn't want this job, you know, he doesn't want to take this from McClellan, but then word comes 
that uh, Joseph Hooker is going to be picked if he does not accept it. And Burnside then accepts because <laughs> <laughs> Burnside and Joseph Hooker do not like each other. Yeah, in this yeah. Um, so at this point when Burnside takes command on November 9th, he's got about five days uh, to get his, his shit in gear. And on November 14th, uh, or actually the day before, he had sent plans of movements and marching orders to Lincoln. Uh, and at this point, Henry Halleck, who is the um, military general in chief at the time, you know, Halleck is the middle guy between Lincoln and uh, Lincoln and Stanton. And of course, oh, yeah, there he is. Uh, so he Henry, is. yeah, Henry Halleck, our old lame brains, as his nickname goes. <laughs> Uh, very it important novel, character. this guy. Yeah. To me. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, Burnside sending Halleck his his plan. Halleck sends it to Lincoln and Stanton. They all approve it. And so by November 14th, Burnside is marching. And what's really impressive is that when this campaign begins, it begins very promisingly for the Union Army. They're going to move from Warrington to Fredericksburg in three days. 120,000 men are going to be on the march for three days and a bunch of them are gonna reach Falmouth, as you can see down there, um, and just on November 17th, in just three days of marching. And the greatest thing about it is they steal a march on Robert E. Lee. The Confederates do not react right away to this. So the, you can see the Confederate lines there, you can see the movements and everything, um, but they do not react right away. Burnside is going to make great time with this. But one thing I wanna back up and talk about here is if you're asking yourself, if you've never heard about Fredericksburg, if you're asking yourself, why is he getting started so late? So remember when we said, we were talking there about the Emancipation Proclamation taking effect. I was, I got sidetracked there, I now realize. It <laughs> takes effect on January. <clears throat> so if a North that is not very popular or does not favor the Emancipation Proclamation as much uh, is going to have a negative attitude towards it, the thing to turn that around in Lincoln's mind is to accompany the passage of that proclamation with a military victory in the field mm -hmm. and not just in Virginia across the board. So when Burnside starts moving, it should be noted, William Rosecrans, Army of the, Army of the Cumberland, the new Army of the Cumberland is gonna be moving towards Stones River. Mm -hmm. William T. Sherman, Ulysses S. Grant are gonna be moving in tandem towards Vicksburg. You have Union armies across the board all on the move, all with the same objective win a military battlefield victory before January 1st, 1863. By that point, when they start marching, that gives Burnside, at the very least, a month and a half <laughs> to, get a a, get, to get a victory. And that's going to be a, a huge order to fill when you have that much pressure on your back. So not only do we have to march, get down towards Richmond, but we have to cross the Rappahannock, find a place to fight Lee, beat him, do something that no one has done yet, and well, with the exception of McClellan, you know, and, you know, do that all before January 1st, all before this proclamation. So, uh, yeah. you know, I always like to remind people of that. I mean, give Birdside some slack here. You wouldn't want to be in this position, uh, given the circumstances that you are now facing as a commander of the army. But sure. nevertheless, when that campaign started on the 14th, by God, did they make good time. Um, hmm. So first elements of the Union Army start to arrive at Falmouth on Stafford Heights overlooking the Rappahannock River. And they can clearly see right across the river into Fredericksburg, which by the time they got there on November 17th, only a thousand Confederate militia in that area. There's about 40,000 Union soldiers that arrived there on the 17th. So for all natural purposes, this should have been a quick pit stop. Fredericksburg never should have been a, a place of battle. It was just supposed to be a logistical area to move through. But like I had said, all the bridges had been destroyed earlier that spring. So before he even got on the march, part of the plans he had sent to Halleck for approval, part of that plan also was a request for pontoon bridges. Pontoons that, like those wagons there, that's what they would transport on over land. Um, he is asking for them to be floated down the river from D.C. to Aquia Landing, then marched overland from Aquia Landing using those wagons from Aquia Landing to Falmouth and have those wagons waiting there with those pontoons on the 17th when those Union soldiers arrived. Well, and the engineers have gone ahead, correct? Uh, like the engineers are waiting or do they come or they delayed as well? The engineers are going to be there um, with most of those first couple elements of the army 
Okay. Um, as well as Calvary, assorted everybody. You know, they're all just spread out, but they're all making really good time at this point. The problem is when they get there, the pontoons are nowhere to be found. When Burnside inquires to their location, uh, Halleck is going to tell him, oh, yeah, they're still sitting in the warehouse. They haven't even started their journey. So if you're Burnside, this is your first setback. And your boss just really dropped the ball on this. And Halleck, of course, will blame somebody else uh, for this. But nevertheless, he gets right on it. But we can't move forward without these pontoons. And there's a couple of reasons why. Firstly, the weather is shit. It's rainy. There's some scattered snow showers, but mostly rain. The roads are mud. Moving men across from point A to point B has been made 10 times harder by the weather. It's a miracle that this army was able to get to Fredericksburg as quickly as they did in three yeah. days. But now the river, the currents are undulating. They, they are up, they're down, they're fast, they're slow. You can't very well build a pontoon bridge across the river. So some of the many people, the biggest question I got, well, there's fords in the area. Why didn't they ford the river? Well, there was a very, there was a very serious worry in Burnside's eyes. If we cross the river, a good portion of the army without the pontoons at one of these fords, and then say it rains and the river mm -hmm. floods, a portion of that army is going to be trapped on the wrong side of the river with the entire Confederate army in the area. Yeah. And so it should be noted that by the 17th, Longstreet, while you know they're going to lose the race to Fredericksburg, Longstreet's first corps of the Confederate army is responding. They're on their way. And so... Burnside's mind is, I don't want to cross a big portion of my army, get it stuck on that side of the river due to the rains, due to no pontoons being in place, and have them be trapped there against the rest, the whole might of the Confederate army. That's just a disaster waiting to happen. And so also what kind of adds to that anxiety is while there's only a bunch of Confederate militia in the town of Fredericksburg, there's a lot of Confederate cavalry riding around. Jeb Stewart is one of the first to be on the scene to respond. He's going to have people set up at Banks Ford at Ely's Ford. Um, he's going to have people all the way down the river at Port Royal. You can see where D.H. Hill's line there is. Uh, that is also a possible place that Burnside wanted to cross. But Port Royal is very much defended by Confederate skirmishers, militia skirmishers, and cavalry skirmishers as well. And it's still the same worry that if the currents rise, we're going to be trapped here. But he, you know, the, he's also worried that if he moves all the way down to Port Royal, he's going to extend his lines too far. From Aquia Landing to Port Royal, you can see there on the map, you know, I can get my fingers together there, obviously. But imagine an army spread out between those two points with a Confederate cavalry commander that can cross many different points on those bodies of water at the Rappahannock, the Rapidan, what have you, and possibly, you know, strike your supply. So Burnside just doesn't want to take any risk if he doesn't have to. And he's expecting the Confederates to defend these fords more. So he decides that we're going to wait for the pontoons and we are going to cross where the enemy least expects it. This is Burnside's words. He decides to cross directly in his front, right in the vicinity of Fredericksburg. He says, Lee will never expect this. Well, it takes about 10 days for the pontoon bridges to arrive at Falmouth. And by that point, uh, it should be noted, um, three days after the Union arrived, the Confederate First Corps arrives on the 20th of November. They number about 40,000 men. So real quick, from 1,000 to 40,000 combatants, now it's no longer going to be an easy crossing. And even after the boats arrive on the 27th of November, Burnside still can't wait because the rains picked up again. And a lot of the fords, a lot of the places they were planning on crossing are now flooded. And the river is swollen, moving very quickly. And this means we can't build that bridge on rushing water. We have to wait till the tide calms. Well, finally, it looks like the river's going down by December 10th, or the tides are, the current is slowing, and it looks like the, the water level's going down. And so Burnside decides that the 11th will be the day that the engineers will lay those planks to cross yeah. in the immediate vicinity of Fredericksburg. And, and meanwhile, none of this is a secret anymore to the Confederates, because they stole that march on them, yep. and then they sat. So the Confederates have been observing, I mean, yeah, cavalry and infantry yeah. for that matter, are just, are just waiting and reacting at this point. They're not, none of this is, is a surprise.
Yeah, there, um, there, there are going to be. There's a lot of taunting and and name calling across the river, um, but the Confederates are going to swell by the day between the 20th of November and probably roughly December 5th to the 6th. The rest of the Confederate army is going to start to arrive, and it should be noted the same situations on the roads rain turning the roads to muddy quagmires it's going to play yeah. better too especially jackson's guys you have to come out of the have to go over the blue ridge mountains in winter weather and then yeah. come down get on you know different roads that lead towards fredericksburg not a lot of rail lines going directly east as you can see there so they do have to go over land and so they're going to be bogged down but they have all the time in the world to do this um, because yeah. unbeknownst to them, Burnside is waiting for the pontoons. Unbeknownst, he's waiting for the river to calm. Yeah. And so by December 10th, yeah, there's a Confederate army of 78,000 soldiers uh, on the other side of the river. And they are now going to be aligned on a formidable defensive position waiting for the Union to make a move. And, and just to uh, just quickly, maybe you can touch on us. There was around this time, I don't know exactly the date, so you can tell me that – uh, Burns had attempted to coordinate with a naval action downriver from Fredericksburg as well that didn't work out. So there was an attempt with another sort of uh, seaborne infantry coordinated yeah. sort of thing. What, what, what was the story with that? Just I want to get too off track on that, but but I think yeah, that's yeah, interesting. It's, it's okay, I honestly don't know much about that part of the campaign. Only that uh, they did try to get up the Rappahannock, but found it was too shallow. Uh, okay. they could not get that far up the river. And so a lot of the naval air, a lot of the naval forces in the area are going to be on the Potomac mostly, um, okay. really coordinating with transport and support. But as far as getting gunboats up the Rappahannock to maybe get towards Port Royal, you can see where DH Hills guys are there. Uh, mm -hmm. Ultimately, they can't get that far up. And okay. so there's a lot of Confederate artillery on bluffs um, mm -hmm. watching those entry points. And so a lot of those guns are not going to be able to get. Um, or a lot of those boats are not going to be able to really successfully pass those points uh, for those reasons. So, yeah, he's ultimately going to decide we're going to do this bifrontal move across the river. And you have to understand that um, there has not been a serious street fight. There's not been a serious urban battle in the war up until this point. Um, so I don't believe that Burnside was really thinking in terms of making a prolonged fight at the crossing. But... Uh, nevertheless, he's going to select three different points on the river and in the immediate vicinity, just north of the old Chatham Bridge is going to be Upper Crossing, uh, upper crossing. near the city docks on the south end of town uh, would be Middle Crossing. And then about further three to four miles downriver, um, there was going to be Lower Crossing in the more open areas. And you can see from the photo there, that is a shot of Lower Crossing. Uh, and that is going to be uh, the crossing point of the left grand division of the union army so why well, as i say that i noticed i didn't go into that so that's another thing burnside does a little differently uh he consolidates his his army into three big basically mega core <laughs> uh but they call them grand divisions and the idea was uh burnside had seen how disproportionate the union and confederate army were in previous battles you have all these different core in the union army but the confederates have two two giant corps, Long Street, Jackson. So in doing this in this organization, a lot of people said that doesn't make sense. It's super confusing. I can see why he did it. I can see why he would organize his army like this to maybe consolidate the numbers so that a one union corps isn't outnumbered by one Confederate corps in this kind of situation. And so you have the left grand division, which will be the union first and sixth corps, the union center grand division, which is the third and fifth corps and the right grand division, um, which is going to be commanded by Edwin B. Sumner. They are the second and ninth corps. They are the ones who are going to be crossing in the immediate vicinity of uh, Fredericksburg itself. So um, I can go right into that if you want to keep going to that. Or yeah, you... yeah, let's. Um, we have a couple questions. I think we'll come back to these at the end a little bit. Dan Casella has a couple and uh, John Heckman. Um, but I think the answers to these questions may come as we talk about the battle itself. Okay. Um, so let's, let's go back here to the battle map sure. and we can get to what actually happens at Fredericksburg. I know he's, I'd said we weren't going to get too bogged down in the tactical stuff. Um, but here I'll, I'll, if you can, you guys can see my cursor on the map here, there's this hand, uh, I'm putting it where the upper crossing 
the middle crossing and the lower crossing of the rivers were that he just referred to. This gray area is the town of Fredericksburg. And uh, so in a, in a, I guess the a condensed way, <laughs> Because, uh, because again, we could we could spend six hours talking about the what happens at, at Fredericksburg right. on this this day. Um, so let's get to the point that the pontoon bridges have been constructed. Uh, we can touch on that a little bit. They've been constructed under fire. Uh, yeah. They actually sent f they they attempted to construct the pontoon bridges. It wasn't going real well, so they just sent troops across the river in an amphibious assault, basically. Uh, to secure the other side of the river against sharpshooters in a bridgehead, they get the bridges laid. So now let's go to, we'll s skip the evening of the 12th and the, the pillaging of the town and all that uh, to, to keep moving forward. But on the morning of the 13th, we have Union forces that have crossed. Uh, so with that in mind, who's where that morning, 159 years ago, and what then you can tell us about how the day goes for everybody. Okay, so um, the as I said, the left grand division, that's the first and sixth corps. They're under William Franklin. They are going to be to the south of Fredericksburg, about five miles down there. They are anchored along the Bowling Green Road, which is Route 2 today. Um, you can drive that. Out there, there is land that has been preserved by Civil War, um, by the Battlefield Trust, uh, which is the area of the Slaughter Pen Farm. We still, there's a lot of accounts that really don't know the name or the owner of the farmstead that is there, but there was a small farm area in those open fields west of the Bowling Green Road, and th that area is going to be very, very important. And so uh, Burnside had actually gone over the plan with his commanders on the night of December 12th to both uh, Franklin down there on the south and then to Edwin Sumner commanding the right Grand Division up there in the city. Uh, the 2nd and 9th Corps, you know, these two units, these two corps, they are going to make simultaneous assaults on the Confederate line. You can see it there in red. All in all, that's about five miles of hills that the Confederates are going to be entrenched upon. They've had plenty of time to fortify uh, those crests with uh, rifle pits. Most of that area is going to be heavily wooded, uh, minus the areas that you can see where the blue arrows are pointing towards there. That is the base of Willis Hill that's part of Marie's Heights. And that is going to be the location of a sunken road with a stone wall uh, to its east. And that is going to be a major defensive position for the uh, Confederates. The, yeah, and that is the, the Stonewall the today. The Stonewall today, as it appears. Uh, now, yeah, it's mostly been reconstructed. Uh, the only original portion of the wall is out of the shot, uh, but you can find it. It's it's almost overgrown. By it's, the, here's its yeah. appearance at the at the yeah. time. Okay. And so okay. the idea was for Burnside, uh, he wanted both of these assault, these attacks to go forward, but he knew that Sumner would probably have a tougher time of it, given his uh, immediate front was wide open. There are Confederate artillery that have now bracketed all of the open ground, uh, which it will become no man's land eventually. Yeah. And um, all, all because of that delay. These are very well prepared defensive positions yeah, yeah. and measured. And, and uh, it's, it's, this battle is a lot less fluid than much combat prior to this, right? Because the Confederates have had time to really, uh, I mean, seriously, the, the our Confederate artillery was firing uh, from Maurice Heights, right? Judging at where every, the distance. And I mean, this was a D-Day style like defense <laughs> to well, me. Well, yeah, it's, 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 practically. it's formidable. It is a formidable defense. But one thing I always touched on when I was a park guide there is that this is not a perfect defense. There sure. are imperfections to it and Union do almost exploit part of those imperfections. So if you want to go back down to the South, uh, Franklin, under the impression on December 12th that he's got the main assault, He's going to throw uh, to the previous orders about 65,000 men. That's element, that's his whole right, uh, excuse me, his whole left grand division and elements of the center grand division under Hooker in support. They were going to throw 65,000 men at Prospect Hill down there, which is the center of Stonewall Jackson's line. The only problem with that is in the wee hour morning of December 13th, Burnside is going to send out another dispatch to William Franklin. And the attacks were supposed to begin at dawn. They don't begin at dawn. The courier gets lost or he's late. Who knows what happens? But by 7.30, he's arriving at Franklin's headquarters on that side of the river. Burnside will never set foot on the west side of the Rappahannock the entire battle. Um, so Franklin is getting a note in the morning from Burnside, and this is what it reads. This is where everything goes wrong. It's this order that says, keep your whole command in position for a rapid movement down the old Richmond Road, the Bowling Green Road, and send 
a division at least, to seize, if possible, the height near Captain Hamilton's. That's Hamilton's Crossing. This is going to be down there on the map. You can see it there. And taking care to keep it well supported in its line of retreat open. So if you're saying, what the hell did he just say? That's exactly what Franklin was thinking. These orders are very, very strange. They contradict Burnside's plan to have Franklin be the main assault and Sumner be a diversion. Now, Franklin from this ascertains that he's the diversion and that Sumner is meant to be the main assault. But he never follows this up. He does not get an explanation from Burnside. He doesn't really even get an explanation from the courier. He just reads this and puts it in his pocket. And what that means is instead of having 65,000 men going at Prospect Hill, he's going to send about 4,500. It's going to be a division uh, from the Union First Corps. That left Grand Division, that is going to be George Meade's Pennsylvania Reserves. They will be supported on their right by John Gibbon's troops. John Gibbon is notable because he's a North Carolinian that is a Unionist. He is going to be confronting Confederate units that contain three of his brothers. So this is very brother on brother style action here. And the assaults that were meant to begin at dawn don't really start getting, <laughs> don't start moving until between 10 and 11 in the morning. And it should be noted that both sides of the field, these assaults will start at the same time. You have Meade going towards Prospect Hill. Uh, William French's division of uh, the Second Union Corps under Darius Couch, they are going to be the first assault against the stone wall at the same time. So these assaults begin in the same time as they're supposed to, but both have very different results. Uh, so for obviously the Union forces at the stone wall, they don't even get within about 100 yards. Uh, the volume of fire is so intense. However, Meade and Gibbon, as you can see there, there is a line cutting through the battlefield. That is the Fredericksburg, Richmond, and Potomac Railroad. And that rail line is going to be really the only form of cover in the open field that the Union forces can take cover behind. Union, uh, excuse me, Confederate artillery will be shelling them out in the open. And Meade is, uh, is actually going to be able to uh, shift a portion of his, of his division, two of his brigades, into a little finger of trees that kind of jut down from... Uh, from Prospect Hill and kind of almost reach the railroad cut itself. If you go to the battlefield today and visit Prospect Hill, which is one of the stops on the auto on the auto tour, you, you can see this really well. Um, and it's be, and it should be noted here, as I said, this is not a perfect Confederate defense because Jackson and Lee had both ex inspected this side of the line. Now you can see that from if uh, can you zoom in a little more, Richard, on Lane and Archer there? Yeah. Perfect. That's fine. Get... Yeah, that's that's perfect. So okay. if you notice uh, from this map, the lines of Lane, Greg, and Archer, they are not congruent. They're, there's a mm -hmm. gap in that line. And that was because in the middle of that open area where there are no Confederate soldiers, there was a swamp that AP Hill had deemed impassable. Any Union force that comes through there is going to get bogged down, disorganized. They're not going to come that way. And both Lee and Jackson look at the same area and agree with him. So this is a huge fuck up all the way to the top of the army. They leave this area open. Where do you think Meade's two brigades are going? Right into that gap. And, and it's somewhat that, accidental, right? That they kind of yeah, don't hit and resistance and they all just funnel, kind of funnel in there, right? Yeah. 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 They were taking cover from artillery when they found that gap. And they are going to smash right into Maxie Gregg's the South Carolinians gobble them up. Maxie Gregg is going to be mortally wounded during this action. They're routed, and from there, they split open, and they go opposite directions. One brigade is going to attack James Lane, who is being attacked by Gibbon. He's going to give way. Archer down there is going to peel backwards. They're going to start shooting almost into the rear of his Tennesseans. At one point, the men of the 14th Tennessee take off running, and their brethren in the 7th Tennessee start shooting at them to get them to stop. I mean, it's a very heated moment, and this is all happening uh, between 11.30 to noon as the assaults are continuing further up the line um, at the stone wall on the base of Marie's Heights. And so, isn't, there, yeah. isn't there something right in that moment too, or Talia Farrow and maybe AP Hill himself don't really believe that Meade's troops are there and yeah, there's yeah. some reluctance to, to, to plug the hole as well. So even when it's, they didn't think it was going to happen, it happens and they still don't believe that it's happening. So this is a perfect, it's really a perfect situation for Meade's, Troops can, I mean, as beat up as they are at that point of the attack. But. Oh, yeah. There is no court. There is, they are very disorganized by this point, I should mention. They're more like a mob of, of soldiers just shooting at anything that's not wearing Union blue. But visibility is going to become very limited. Uh, you also got to remember it's winter, so, you know, there's not a lot of 
dense foliage. There's not a lot of tree coverage, but nevertheless, uh, it's still thick wood. It's still, you know, thick area to kind of attack through. So you're going to lose that disorgan. You're going to, you're going to lose that organization, very similar to what we talked about during the wilderness. And nevertheless, even though Mead is on, he's got a foothold on the hill, he's alone. Gibbon can't assist him. Gibbon's already dealing with his own breakthrough against Lane. Most of Talia Farrow, or it's been pronounced Tolliver. I don't care that this doesn't sound right. <laughs> uh, but Talia Farrow is going to send his brigades against Gibbon. While um, it should be noted that there should have been, so we had talked about D.H. Hill. Uh, he had actually shifted down the line. Jackson had actually shifted him over to Hamilton Crossing. Uh, because he believed Doubleday up there on the map was going to swing around to, to his flank, which, fair enough, Doubleday had been marching out there, but only to deal with one lone Confederate artilleryman, who I'm not going to name because fuck John Pelham. But the point is, is that, um, nevertheless, the only real defense behind a Hill is Jubal Early. And mm. so it's Jubal Early's troops that, without Jackson's orders, mind you, uh, they do lead their assault. Now, Jubal Early is in hot water with Jackson because he was supposedly drunk on the campaign trail to Fredericksburg and Jackson caught him. And Jackson is a hardcore Presbyterian Bible thumping general. You know that didn't fly over well. So Early knows he's in deep shit with General Jackson. And here he acts without orders. He's going to throw as many of his brigades as he can into Meade's Pennsylvanians, and those guys are going to be pushed back. Meade does not have any reinforcements to exploit that. It's really only the first corps involved. The most immediate forces in the area are going to be the third corps troops from the Setter Grand Division. Most of the sixth corps, their fellow, their sister Grand Division corps, had actually been sent to the center of the line uh, to hold against a possible Confederate counterattack up there. So that's why they're not in their immediate vicinity. That's going to be uh, W. F. Smith there. That's William F. Smith or Baldy Smith. He's going to be there um, and more or less in support of that assault. Now um, there is an element of that. Confederate, excuse me, of the Union Third Corps that is going to be in the immediate vicinity. That is David Burney's division from George Stoneman's Third Corps. Burney is a abolitionist. He is, uh, you know, a very prominent general. He will rise to prominence in commanding a division in the Second Corps in the Overland Campaign. But Burney had gotten in hot water on the peninsula for making a move without orders before. And so what happens next is very interesting, and this is something that comes up in debate a lot, is why didn't Meade get the support he needed? After mm -hmm. he is pushed off Prospect Hill, Meade rides back to the Bowling Green Road. First officer he sees is David Burney. Now, these guys are both the same rank. And Meade had sent a courier to Burney saying, hey, get your troops to come in behind me, support us, we have a breakthrough. Well, those troops never came. So by the time Meade is coming off this hill, his frock coat is filled with bullet holes. Somehow he never gets hit throughout the whole day. His division is in shambles. Uh, for those who have survived, they're now in disorganized state. They're taking cover behind a railroad cut, and they're now falling back towards the Bowling Green Road. So when Meade rides up on Bernie, he is fuming. You know, I mean, just goes off on Bernie. But Bernie says, I can't take orders from you. You're the same rank as me. I need a corps commander to give me the orders to go forward. That would have been John Reynolds. He was the closest guy. Hooker's not even, or Stoneman's not even on the side of the river yet either. So Hooker, or excuse me, John Reynolds, first corps commander, is the highest ranking officer who could have told Bernie to go forward. He doesn't because no one can find John Reynolds. John Reynolds is not on the line. John Reynolds is back with the artillery positions near the river. He's not even watching things unfold. So where he and why he's choosing to be there, that's been one of the biggest mysteries here. So mm -hmm. because of these leadership failures, the greatest opportunity for the Union to win ultimately fails by three o'clock when they are pushed off Prospect Hill. And the Confederates chase them. Edmund Atkinson's Georgians, who had been muchly responsible for pushing Meade off the hill, follow him. They get the order by Jackson or get the go ahead to just charge down the hill. Now this is very stupid because Edmund Atkinson will be killed here. The Georgians are going to charge into open fields right around that slaughter pen farm. And guess what? About ooh, 174 Union guns just open up on these guys in the open fields. And it's a, it's a, it, for a battle that is hailed as so lopsided, well, bulk of the Confederate casualties, about 5,000 total for the battle, 4,000 of them are going to be accrued around Prospect Hill. And about half of those 4,000, that's going to be right there in the slaughter pen farm. That's how that gets its name. So with that move off the hill and, you know, that Southern aggression that you're seeing uh, and the counterattack that Jackson just tried to attempt, 
that's going to worry Burnside because now if you go back to the other side of the, of the battlefield up where Sumner has been throwing his entire right grand division against the stone wall, that entire force is in shambles. All of the union second Corps is committed to that assault. Pretty much two thirds of the ninth Corps was committed to that assault. No effect, no luck. No one's even gotten close. The Irish brigade got within a hundred yards and took horrendous casualties. Of course, they got to be noted obviously, but nevertheless, this is going to concern Burnside because now it's a post three o'clock. You have, since it's winter, about two hours till dark. If the Confederates under Longstreet attempted at any point to make a counterattack like Jackson just did down at Prospect Hill, if they try to come down the hill, these troops aren't going to be strong enough to stop them. This will, they'll be pushed right back into the city. It'll become a disorganized mob to retreat across. Oh, look at those two crossings. That's about it. It'll be a disaster. And this is all what Burnside is playing in his mind. So that is why after these assaults go forward from the 2nd Corps and the 9th Corps, he's going to order the 5th Union Corps, including the 20th Maine, to continue to make the assaults to keep the Confederates in their positions to buy for time. They're now wait, they, they're sacrificing men for time here until it's dark enough to safely withdraw in an orderly fashion away from this position. So that is why the assaults will continue all the way till almost 6.30, uh, Rush Hawkins Brigade of George Washington Getty's Division of the 9th Union Corps. They are the last Union assault of the day at 630, and they meet with the same results. Everyone gets repulsed. Every single Union assault that goes up against that stone wall is repulsed. And by the morning of December 14th, Union casualties now total 13,000, between 12 to 13,000 men. Confederate casualties, as I said, is only at 5,000. It is a absolutely lopsided battle in terms of casualties. And from the from the perspectives of those who were there, Union had a much harder time of it, obviously. Mm. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna just point out that these, so these two new maps that I pulled out, the one on uh, your left, the viewer's left, uh, this is the, the the afternoon situation that Avery just, just described, where uh, the left division has sort of settled in here in this, somewhat defensive stance i guess by the oh, yeah. afternoon they're, they're they're recovering their lines uh here in the top you can see they're still banging their head against the 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 sunken road position at marie's heights uh and also too i noticed that these maps there's no reinforcements on the other side of the river so I'd right like everybody's on this side really, except artillery well so, you can see these artillery positions uh, i'll move the cursor these little blue kind of hatches uh, so those are good see, supporting artillery, right? But Yeah, and you also see Hooker's name there. So a bulk of the Setter Grand Division is on that side of the river still. Is, okay. they, will, they will send brigade, they will send them basically by brigade over. So Charles Griffin's division, and Andrew Humphrey's division of the 5th Corps, they go over. Um, and of course, Emil Whitfield, he's going to send a, a couple of his brigades to the stone wall. Um, David Burney's divisions over there. So it's piecemeal. There are still some reserves and it should be noted the 11th and 12th Corps are all the way up in Stafford. So they are nearby. So there are reserves in the area, but in terms of uh, safely back across the river, two thirds yeah. of the Union Army's here. And yeah. yeah, it's very dangerous position. Yeah, and they're on. They're they're just they're on their own. If anything, if there is a counterattack, like you said, from the Union left flank or or whatever, they just there's nowhere to go and nobody's coming to help you, no matter what. At that point, yeah. So okay. yeah, that is what ultimately Burnside is going to keep ordering those assaults. So a lot of people say, "Oh, it was futile. It was useless. It was a waste of men." Um, for those of us who can say that or who have said that, uh, you probably never commanded an army before and you never faced something like that. So sure, just think about it in terms of perspective in terms yeah. of why you as a commander would order such a hard order um and he's going to watch you know from the heights of stafford heights he's going to watch everything unfold and it's it, I, I mean it's got to be a real shitty situation obviously um yeah. so you, you got i got to give burnside at least some some sympathy there um and so it's going to be a few days before he raises the white flag of truce to collect his wounded out in the open so a lot of the men who are still wounded out in front of Marie's Heights are in front of Prospect Hill. They are going to be laying out there for a few days. It's not till the 6th of December that the flag is actually raised. And finally, a lot of the stretcher bearers are permitted to go out and collect the wounded, but some, many of which have perished due to, you know, blood loss or trauma, or even in some cases, hypothermia. Um, temperatures did drop to between 25 to 30 degrees at night. They were between 50 to 60 degrees during the day. 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing too. I was going to mention that the temperature of this battle. You know, you see a lot of in in more contemporary art depicting the battle. Everybody's in an overcoat with a scarf and this whole thing. It wasn't it wasn't a frozen snowy landscape. It was a mud pit. Yeah, it was, it was extremely it was muddy. Sixty degrees, and so thinking again about some of those those factors of of moving men and army around. Maybe the couple weeks before had been more rain, but it wasn't. It wasn't easy. Like they were committed. Like this is where we're at, and this is yeah. probably all we're going to be able to move. Uh, as far as you know, reinforcements or another, an alternative plan. Like this, this is the hand he was dealt. Like you said, and yeah. and uh, and I do think the warmth maybe was actually a, strangely kind of a factor in that because it, oh, it made moving wagons and artillery and ambulances and all those things just that much more difficult. You really, you really can't read a battle account from Fredericksburg without reading about soldiers slipping and sliding as they advance yeah. in the open. Yeah. Um, and it gets a little more graphic for the guys making the assaults after the morning assaults against the walkers. They're stepping through carnage as well, um, mixed with mud and everything else. And it's just such a horrific scene. It almost feels like a World War I style uh, battlefield by the end of the day. But yeah, as soon as the sun goes down, the temperatures plummet. And yeah. I mean, that's, that's just freaking that's Northern Virginia, Maryland weather for you folks, for anyone who yeah. doesn't know, I think that that hasn't changed in 159 yeah. years. So, um, but the point is, it's just, yeah, this is, it's just a very abysmal, abysmal defeat for the union yeah. because of the, uh, not just lopsided casualties, but because of the nature of many of them still being out there and men having to listen to men cry out every night until their voices are silenced. And on top of this defeat, Lincoln's going to hear of setbacks across the board. Um, yeah. So uh, Grant, when he had started going overland, you know, got to mention Grant, obviously uh, his campaign at Vicksburg is actually going to be delayed because his base of supplies was raided and pretty much destroyed at Holly Springs, Mississippi by my personal least favorite person in the world, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's going to make a bunch of very similar frontal assaults against entrenched positions at a place called Chickasaw Bayou or Chickasaw Bluffs, just north of the city of Vicksburg. That ends in a re very bloody repulse, but not as bad as this. And uh, the only real light in the darkness is the tactically stalemated Battle of Stones River. Mm -hmm. um, but strategically, the Confederates will retreat. So it is a Union victory uh, literally on New Year's Day, the day that the Emancipation Proclamation is signed into effect. So Lincoln will credit Stones River on, 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 on the side of things um, with the proclamation. But Richard, rhetorical question time. <laughs> Which battle do you think people were more concerned with, Stones River or Fredericksburg? Oh, F Fredericksburg was, it, yeah. it haunted, <laughs> I mean, it haunted the war effort. It haunted uh, politically. It haunted the soldiers themselves for years, for two years. Oh, yeah. It was still, it was, it was in the back of everybody's mind. It was the, the defeat that you would always refer to, you know, and I, I've heard, I've read mention of that, you know, when uh, in the aftermath of Pickett's Charge, for example, the, the cheer that went out, the chant was Fredericksburg and it was a, a, a horrible memory and a motivation. And so the, it had this battle, for for not achieving much beyond bloodshed, it had a massive legacy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think. Um, oh, absolutely. Um, so I want to um, just touch on, if you don't mind, touch on a couple questions here. Sure. Uh, and, and I think this is a great timing for this question. Uh, that uh, one viewer says, "Do you think Burnside's problem as a commander is that he was too inflexible? Uh, that he was not capable of changing his tactics?" Uh, he was always kind of crashed against the wall, whether it was this or the Battle of the Crater, for example, um, that that this was this was his problem is that he was going to have a plan and he was going to be fixed to it. Hit start and just let it go. And, and do you do you think that's a thing with Burnside? I mean, it's not a reoccurring trait. I mean, we can easily look at December 13th and July 30th, 1864 and mm -hmm. say, you know, these are really the only two excuse me, instances where Burnside's really in charge of an attack that, you know, looks very daunting beforehand and it ultimately falls yeah. to pieces. Um, but the thing is, is that Burnside, you know, you can say the same thing for Antietam, but at Antietam, at least he took the bridge, you know, that same kind of tactic, sure. that same type of uh, style of, of combat there, it, it is there. I think with Fredericksburg, um, you know, he, 
the mistakes that he makes, they're not abnormal. They're not incredibly so unique to the point where you're like, only Burnside would do such a stupid thing. Yeah. I mean, the whole yeah. not clarifying orders, that happens literally, <laughs> that happens to Lee. That happens to Robert sure. and Lee. Like, you know, sure. Gettysburg, prime example of that. So I think it's just, honestly, I will attribute it to the fog of war in a much more broader sense. And maybe that's not the answer everyone's looking for, but the fog of yeah. war is just, like I said, it's the unexpected. It's just the tiny little sure. things that derail your whole plans. For for yeah. him, it's literally, imagine if those pontoon bridges are where they should be on the 14th when they get here, or excuse me, on yeah. the 17th when they got to Falmouth. I mean, this could have been an entirely different campaign. I'm not saying it would have been a huge success. It just would have been a different campaign. I think yeah. the cards that he has dealt, um, you know, it, they're, you can just even say the guy was just nervous. I mean, this is his first major battle as the army commander and, you know, things that he probably should have remembered to do. He may have just simply forgot. Um, and, you know, I, I, I like playing this devil's advocate card with Burnside because it's so easy to jump on his case and say, you're, mm -hmm. you're a buffoon. You're inflexible. You don't do anything differently. You're, you know, you're not any different from anybody else, but that's the case. That's the real thing. He isn't any different from any other army commander. He's going to have the same obstacles, same flaws. The only thing is, is sometimes you're just very fortunate and sometimes very unfortunate on a battlefield. And I think yeah. it doesn't get more unfortunate than Fredericksburg. Weather was against him. Time was against him. Politics were against him. And, and, and the enemy, I mean, you're fighting freaking Robert E. Lee on probably one of the strongest defensive positions of the entire war. Um, I would even say these defenses are way better than his Cold Harbor defenses. And those were said to be mm -hmm. almost in, impregnable. But I'm like, it, this, this is one of the finest defenses. And it's also one of the largest single moments the Confederates are ever going to have. This is a massive army that they have, that they have accrued at, at Fredericksburg. And so, I mean, there's a lot at stake. There's also got to remember there's a defense in depth. I mean, they got it pretty nailed down here. And I think the biggest mistake Burnside makes is thinking that he's going to take Lee by surprise, cr crossing yeah. frontally. But I mean, no matter where he was going to cross, Lee was going to match him. Lee was yeah. going to match his movements because he already stole March on Lee at the beginning of the campaign. Lee was not going to let that happen again. And so I think it's just, it's a very, very difficult situation. Um, I, I'm just glad I was never in that kind of situation. I hope I'm never in this type of situation because uh, there's a lot of tough calls that he had to make. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the message that, that, that early morning message to Franklin that mucks everything up and kind of confuses Franklin, Franklin's going to take, a, he's going to take the fall for this. He's going to be relieved of command uh, after the mud march in, in January of 63. Um, the committee conduct award is going to rule that he's incompetent. And, you know, he's going to lose his, his job over this. So, I mean, Franklin's defense, though, this, this dispatch made no sense, you know, um, and Burnside never clarified it. So Burnside not following up, not being on the other side of the river, you can obviously, I, you know, I can't forgive him for that. You know, you have to be flexible as a commander. You have to be able to uh, move there. And I think in just that, that sense of things, it just, it was just a rough day, rough morning from yeah. the start. And, I mean, nothing, nothing just really went right. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess my final question for you as we kind of wrap up here, just, just to get your thoughts on this. Now, I've heard the idea <clears throat> that Franklin and Sumner uh, were just kind of the wrong guys for the task that they were assigned in that battle. And if their personalities had been flipped, that, that the more cautious Franklin would have been attacking Marie's Heights and Sumner being more aggressive may have managed – the left wing more aggressively and actually capitalized on what Meade did? Or do you think there's any truth to that in your opinion? Or do you just think, man, it was what it was and it just, nobody was going to get any better than, than they did? Yeah, I'm going to err on the side of, uh, I don't really get bogged down with what ifs and I don't think it would have mattered. <laughs> Sumner is, is old as shit. Uh, there's no other way yeah. to wait. He is, at this time he is on his way out the door. His retirement party is like next week after this battle, but like it's, it, it's, he's old Franklin's cautious hookers, super aggressive. It doesn't matter. I think honestly, um, things happen the way they did. It was Murphy's law. Honestly, anything okay. that could go wrong went wrong. And yeah. there's very little fixing that once that here's, gets in motion. Here's Sumner's old face for everybody to, <laughs> to see. Yeah, he, he uh, was one of the oldest men in the Army uh, at the time of the battle. And so I yeah. think, I mean, he he has the tougher assignment attacking from the city. I mean, that's a very difficult assignment altogether. But, um, yeah. you know, if you put him down in the field, 
it, it, I mean, in the field south of town, I don't know if he performs any better. I just yeah. don't know. And I don't know if Franklin performs any differently, um, you know, sending troops up at the stone wall. I mean, you can spend all day speculating from previous commanders, but there's just, yeah, I think ultimately the army of the Potomac, I will say this about that. Uh, the army of the Potomac is still in transition. And what I mean by that is it's not yet the army that we get at Gettysburg. Um, before Fredericksburg, you know, this is still <laughs> McClellan's army. This is still an army of, yeah. even, even you, know, you could even argue by Fredericksburg, they're still not the army of freedom. They're not the army that's going to win and finish this war. But this battle yeah. changes that because yeah. those lopsided casualties, the, the, the way that the Confederates just gun them down in front of that wall, you're right, that does stick with these guys. Yeah. And after this, what I always said is this, this changes the psychology of the army. I mean, George Meade even writes to his wife after the battle, and he says, you know what? I can get one more good licking into the Rebs before this contest is decided. I don't care who the victor is. So he is saying, basically, they slaughtered us. This was simply yeah. murder. They are not going to get away with this. Hence why six months later at Gettysburg, they're chanting Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg. And they continue to chant that. And I, and it, it's very much an enemy that or it's very much a battle that makes them enemies. Because before Fredericksburg, I would argue they were still that brother versus brother romanticized notion, even from the peninsula, from yeah. Second Manassas, from Antietam. But Fredericksburg, the Union forces, at least the U.S. soldiers, they throw that out the window. They said these guys, you know, they gave us one of the most humiliating and brutal defeats yet, and yeah. this, we're not gonna, you know, th this is not gonna stand. So every battle after this, there's a lot less politeness. There's a lot less um, kind of rigidity, I guess, within the Union forces. They are more, at least in the Army Corps, uh, of the officers there with, with Meade and Hooker and anybody else. They are determined to deliver a brutal defeat to Lee. Um, and Meade, I mean, it's, it's just fate that he's the one that ends up giving Lee that defeat at Gettysburg and then ultimately yeah. leading the rest of the war, uh, the Union Army of the Potomac through the rest of the war. Uh, to Appomattox eventually. So I, it, yeah. it is, it's something that I think should, would stand out. Fredericksburg is usually not on the list of pivotal battles of the war, but I would argue it's the psychology that changes and that makes it pivotal after Fredericksburg. Yeah, perfect. Well, that's the, the, the best way to end because that was going to be my last question to you anyway is where this battle stands yeah. among, uh, among the more well-known pivotal battles because I do think uh, even though it's, territorial or tactical outcome is not as significant as others. I think, like you said, the psychology and the timing of it and the motivations that come out of it uh, make this a very, very, very important battle. So, And it is the 10th um, costliest of the war. In the 10th costliest, battle, you're right. Yeah. Number 10, yep. Yeah. So I think we don't have any new questions come in, so I just want to, again, thank Avery uh, for joining us one more time. Uh, I think we can, we can one of these times we're going to get to Chancellorsville and, and uh, other things that are in your wheelhouse and, and Gettysburg and, and so on, because we like having you on. I think Absolutely. our viewers enjoy, 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 uh, enjoy what you have to say. And um, if anybody wants to find you, Battles and Banter podcast – and we are, yep, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can give us a follow. Um, we uh, will post kind of additional blurbs and stuff, but we always post when we have new episodes out. We just put out our 80th episode on Pearl Harbor for its 80th anniversary. So that was a, uh, a cool one to cover. We had uh, the guys from the History Things podcast join us for that one. And uh, yeah, uh, if anyone wants other yeah. reading material, I do recommend a few books. Um, uh, uh, George Rabel's Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg is really good to get a perspective that's not just a military study. Uh, he covers politics. He covers social cultural things as well around Fredericksburg, around D.C. Um, it puts it all into the context of the Fredericksburg campaign. Uh, obviously, there's still Frank O'Reilly's Fredericksburg campaign book, which is the Bible, <laughs> uh, the tactical understanding of, of, of the battle. But if you just wanted something smaller and something to help you on your tours, if you ever are in Fredericksburg, there's also Simply Murder, which is part of the Emerging Civil War series mm -hmm. by uh, Chris Mikowski and Chris White. Um, and it has a little auto toy with it as well. But, you know, like I said, if you go, just make your own um, make your own judgments, I suppose. And you know, try to try to try to look at different perspectives. You know, don't just look at don't look at Fredericksburg as Simply Murder, but look at it as much more of a 
complicated, bigger picture kind of event. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I want to thank all of you for staying up late and watching us. Those that are on the East Coast, uh, thanks, Avery, for staying up to talk to us. Um, and like I said, go check out Battles and Batter, or <clears throat> Battles and Banter. As far as I know, we're not making banter. You guys have at least idea, one yeah. episode on Fredericksburg uh, that I've seen. So if you want to hear more what Avery and Cody and everybody has to say about that battle, they get a little more tactical, I think, than we did that tonight. Is, that is the episode that I get the most drunk on the whole podcast. I, mean, <laughs> I, I was the most inebriated during that uh, during that episode. So if you want some entertainment value and some good laughs, that's the uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Good. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, we'll see you next time. Right. Bye, everybody.